Well, good morning and welcome to online worship for Spencer United Methodist Church. Happy August 1st. Um, my uh, prayer is that you are having a wonderful weekend, a wonderful Sunday morning, uh, and that you're blessed by this time of worship we share together this morning. A few announcements before we uh, move on with worship. First of all, uh, I want to remind you that pictures for our pictorial directory will be taken on September 8th and 9th. Uh, in the afternoon and evening, so uh, you can sign up for those online or through uh, the church office. You can call the church office to set up your appointment for your pictures at uh, 812-829-2980. That's our office number. Our office hours are Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 12.30, so you can call and uh, we'll, uh, we'll be happy to set that up for you through the church office. Um, I also want to share with you uh, our response as a church to the uh, Governor, Governor Holcomb's uh, executive order regarding the use of masks. Technically, uh, the executive order um, excludes uh, religious gatherings on the grounds that in religious gatherings we're still supposed to be keeping six feet apart. Uh, however, we strongly encourage those who come and attend in worship to wear a mask, um, uh, at least going to and from your seat. Uh, when you're in your seat, because we're distance, it's not as big of a deal, but it's really hard to maintain distance when you're going to and from your seat. Uh, so uh, I, we would ask that uh, you do wear the masks because the masks uh, are primarily to protect other people from you. So this is an example. This is a tangible example of demonstrating love for neighbor. By wearing these masks, it's less about protecting ourselves and more about protecting other people from anything that we might be carrying and not know it. And so this is an opportunity for us to love each other as the people of God uh, by wearing the masks to and from our seats. Uh, and um, those who are under the age of eight do not fall uh, under that state mandate. However, we have been requiring uh, our children in the children's ministry to wear children's masks, which we do provide. Um, except in our sensory room. Our sensory room is meant to be a place where kids can feel safe, especially if they're experiencing restlessness or some kind of emotional distress. Uh, so we want to make sure that they're as comfortable as possible uh, when they are in there. So uh, we do encourage you, if you decide to come and worship with us in person, uh, that you please wear a mask uh, to and from your seat. Um, however, uh, we won't be turning anyone away for not wearing a mask, but we encourage you in the spirit of Christian love to do so. Um, I, I think that's all I have in the way of announcements. I do want to remind you that at least in Owen County, um, the children are going to be back, going back to school this week. So please keep them in your prayers, keep the teachers in your prayers, the administrators, the staff, keep them all in your prayers as they start going back to school, that they will be able to uh, put measures in place that they have planned, uh, that they will effectively prevent the spread of infection. Um, the, the stats aren't, aren't looking good for our state right now, so uh, prayers for that as well. Well, um, in a time where we have so much on our minds, so much we're worried about, so much that is so uncertain, stirring up feelings of anxiety and fear. And I hope that if you are dealing with any sort of emotional difficulties or stress, I encourage you to seek out the help of a mental health professional. You can contact me via the church office. Um, and, and get a referral from me. I know some great counselors in Bloomington. Uh, I encourage you to seek out professional help if you are dealing with emotional struggles related to this or any other crisis you might be facing. But certainly a component 
a significant component of mental health is faith in someone greater than you. And we as Christians believe in the God and Father of Jesus Christ. And uh, in praise to God this morning, I would invite you to sing with me a classic hymn written uh, in, uh, originally in German by Martin Luther, one of the great reformers of the Christian faith uh, some uh, uh, 500 years ago. So let's sing together Luther's hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing? Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The Spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Let's pray. God, we thank you that we can depend on you to be our security forever. No matter what the world hits us with, no matter what the world seeks to take away from us, nothing and no one can take you away from us. And there is nothing we truly desire or need that we can lose in this life that you will not restore to us in this life or in the life to come. We thank you for this promise of restoration and redemption. We thank you that we can trust you under any circumstances, circumstances that might cause tremendous fear or despair. You give us hope that can sustain us and enable us to obey and to do what is right. In Jesus' name, amen. So most people know, whether you're worshiping in, in the service with me this morning or watching from home, if you know me, you know I'm a bit of a nerd. And I like a lot of nerdy things, and among them is Star Wars. 
Now, as I was preparing this sermon, I kept having uh, Star Wars quotes popping up in the back of my head, and um, among them uh, have been uh, any time that feelings are mentioned, because I'm going to be talking about feelings. I'm going to be talking about emotion this morning, and, and those themes pop up rather frequently in Star Wars. You hear lines like, search your feelings, or your feelings betray you. Sometimes the villains will say things like, um, give in to your anger, you know, things like that. In fact, my sermon today is titled, Your Feelings Betray You. Because our feelings do often betray us. Now, I don't want to completely put down the role of emotion in being human. Okay, let's get, the, let's get that out of the way first. Emotions are a natural God-given part of being human, and they have a purpose. They have a function. Now, broadly speaking, emotion falls under four different categories. A person can be mad, sad, glad, or afraid. So the, the broad categories are anger, sadness, happiness, and fear, and more nuanced emotions kind of fall under those broad categories. Jealousy, for instance, might be a kind of anger. Uh, um, so, so anyway, those are the broad categories of human emotion, and they each have a purpose. Uh, for example, fear and anger are meant to protect us from harm. The anger is the uh, confronts whatever the threat is, and fear runs away from whatever the threat is. It's a survival instinct. Happiness and sadness are meant to drive us towards things that we need. Food makes us happy, and we're sad when we don't have it, for instance. So happiness and sadness are kind of two sides of the same coin, driving us and motivating us toward things that are beneficial most of the time. But the fact is, though they have a good purpose, like so many things that God put into the universe, evil can take it, twist it, turn it around, and use it for destructive purposes. Our emotions can betray us because often they are at odds with what is right. With what, looking at the big picture, is not beneficial but rather destructive. Some things, sometimes things that look good or look beneficial, when you back up and look at the big picture, are actually quite destructive. And that is why our feelings can betray us, because sometimes we have to take a step back and look at the big picture in order to see what's right, whereas our emotions usually are a response to what's right in front of us. Fear can sometimes make us run from what's right. Anger can drive us to do what's wrong. Sometimes anger can drive us to be aggressive or... or, or um, forceful in a situation that requires gentleness and understanding. Happiness and sadness does not just drive us toward things that we need, but sometimes they can drive us towards things we think we need that are actually harmful to us in the long term, or maybe even harmful to someone else. See, emotion can be an obstacle. It can be a weakness when it comes to doing God's will. Now, we've been in a series called Strength in Weakness, and sometimes our feelings about anything can be a stumbling block, an obstacle, a weakness when it comes to doing God's will, when it comes to doing what God asks of us. Fortunately, the theme in this series has been grounded in something that Paul wrote in his second letter to the Christians in the city of Corinth. He wrote about a time when he was facing a, a spiritual struggle of some kind, and we don't know the exact nature of it, but God responds to Paul's situation by saying, my power is made perfect in weakness. 
You see, when we act out of our own strength, we're the ones who get the glory. It's it, it, the work of God that we do out of our own strength. Well, it, first of all, it's not even really the work of God. It's our own work. And it does nothing to demonstrate to the world the power and goodness of God. But when we act out of our weakness, you know, I want to correct myself there. God gives us our strengths and natural aptitudes and abilities. But God's power is demonstrated in, in an exceptional way when we serve God out of our weakness. Because only through God's power could something be achieved despite or sometimes even because of our own human weaknesses. And so, yes, emotion is part of being human, and yes, it can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing, and yet God can still work through us if we push through what our emotions are telling us and obey God in spite of them. Let's look at some examples from throughout the Bible of people whose feelings betrayed them, but because they overcame those feelings, God was nevertheless able to use them. We're going to start back in the Old Testament, and we're going to go through, and we'll end in the New Testament. We talked about Moses a couple of weeks ago. Well, now we're going to fast forward a few generations. Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt through the wilderness to the promised land. They settle in the promised land, and now we're a few generations after they settled in that place. At that time, the Israelites were being attacked and oppressed by a neighboring people called the Midianites. And God tells a man by the name of Gideon, go in strength, uh, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. And Gideon's answer back to God was, pardon me, my Lord, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. What Gideon is saying here is that his family had the reputation for being the weakest in his tribe, the tribe of Manasseh, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. His family was the weakest. And even he, as an individual, had the reputation for being the weakest one in his family. He was insecure. He did not believe that he could do what God asked him to accomplish. He was insecure, so insecure that no matter how many times God told him that it was through Gideon that God would overthrow the Midianites and, and free Israel from their oppression, he still questioned it. And he did these things like, okay, God, um, and, and this is going to sound like things people do to God today. But it was like this, okay, okay, God, so if this is really what you want to do, if you're really going to save Israel by my hand, um, how about this? Okay, I'm, I'm going to feed you this, this meal, and, 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 I, I, and, and I want you to show me some sort of, of, of miracle. And so um, God consumes the meal instantly in fire. But that wasn't enough to convince him. So he said, okay, I'm going to take this wool fleece, and I'm going to put it outside on the threshing floor, you know, where we separate the wheat from the chaff. And, and, and in the morning, if the ground around it is dry, but the fleece is wet, then I'm the one you've chosen to save Israel from the Midianites. Comes back the next morning, and that fleece is so soaked with dew that he was able to wring out a whole bowl full of water. But it wasn't enough to convince him. He did it one more time. He said, okay, okay, this time I'm going to leave the, the, a dry uh, uh, fleece out again. And if in the morning the ground around is wet from the dew, but the fleece is dry, ah, then I'll believe that you're, you, you've chosen me. So comes back the next day, ground around is wet, fleece is dry as a bone. He was insecure. He needed convincing. He didn't think that he was the one to do it. 
but he would go on to lead 300 men in driving out the Midianites from Israelite territory. And that's a remarkable story too, by the way, if you get a chance to read it. Uh, it's in, I uh, believe, Judges 6 or 7. Uh, read about Gideon and the, how he and those 300 men chased out the Midianites. Well, fast forward a few more generations, we get to another person for whom feelings and emotions were a weakness, a stumbling block to doing God's will. A few more generations go by. Those 12 tribes of Israel get united first under a single king, but after they are united under three kings, they divide into two different kingdoms, northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah. And after this division happens, both kingdoms become increasingly corrupt, both spiritually and socially. They start embracing the worship of other gods who were worshipped by other people groups in the region. They, uh, they begin oppressing the poor, and, and um, the powerful end up gaining more power. It, the society becomes corrupt. And so uh, you get to a king by the name of Ahab who marries a wife named Jezebel. And Jezebel is a worshiper of the Canaanite god Baal. Now under her influence, Ahab or persecutes, probably prosecutes too, the worshipers of Yahweh, the god of Israel, and promotes the worship of Baal. Now, as, now, Elijah was a prophet. He was one who was sent by God to confront the corruption of, of society in the, in, among the Israelites. And because he was a prophet of the God of Israel, of Yahweh, um, and Jezebel was a worshiper of Baal, Jezebel threatened Elijah's life. And Elijah had to flee into the wilderness. And while he was there, he prayed for death. He had come to his, the end of his rope. He said, he says to God, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too, so you know what? Just end it now, God. Elijah was depressed even to the point of being suicidal, asking God to take his life. Elijah was in a pit of despair. But the first thing God did, which is something that a lot of times uh, professional mental health, mental health professionals will tell us to do, we've got to take those irrational thoughts and replace them with rational thoughts. The irrational thought is, I'm all alone. I am the only prophet of Yahweh left. I'm it. So just end it. That's de despair if, there ever, if I've ever heard it. But God tells him, no, no. There are 7,000 in Israel who still worship me, whose knees have not bowed to Baal. And that, uh, that was helpful and eventually, Elijah would go on to work more miracles and to continue his prophetic ministry, and then ultimately would go to heaven without dying. One of only two people I can think of in the Bible who went to heaven without dying. But depression could have stopped him from moving on, but it didn't have to. Then we get to Jonah. Jonah, like Elijah, was a, a prophet, came a little bit later on in history, and God sent Jonah to the city of Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Friends, the Assyrian Empire would be the, the foreign nation that later on conquers the northern kingdom of Israel, completely taking away their a sense of, of, of cultural and religious identity, scattering them among the nations. The northern kingdom was lost to the Assyrian Empire. And even in Jonah's time, Assyria was a threat. 
And here God is telling Jonah to go to their capital to warn them that God wants to destroy the city. We've, based on things Jonah says later, the reason Jonah refuses to go to Nineveh, in fact, it goes the complete opposite direction, is because he thinks the Ninevites deserve God's punishment. He doesn't want to warn them. Because he knows that if he warns them and they do decide to change their ways, they're not going to get punished, and he wants them to be punished. He's resentful. He harbors resentment for the Ninevites. And of course, you know that after Jonah went the wrong store, went the opposite direction, he had the most famous bit, the most famous big fish story in history. Well, ultimately, after that harrowing experience, Jonah does go and prophesy to. Uh, the Ninevites, and they repent. They, they, they decide to change their ways. Even the king himself announces that the whole city is going to uh, put on sackcloth and ashes as a symbol of mourning over their, their wrongdoing and, and give up their evil ways. And as a consequence, God does not destroy the city. And, and Jonah Jonah's story does not end happily because at the very end, Jonah is still, he's angry that God forgave the Ninevites. He says, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. His resentment drove him into a depression. He resents that God forgave his nation's enemies. Sometimes resentment, as in the case of Jonah, can get, a, get in the way of us serving God and obeying God. Often obeying God means serving and loving People we don't see eye to eye with. People we don't like are very enemies. And yet God calls us to seek their good anyway. Because he does. At one time, every single one of us was God's enemy. That's why he sent his son to broker the peace. To make it possible for us to become his friends instead of his enemies. That's why God calls us to love our enemies, because he loved his enemies enough to make them into adopted children. Moving on to the New Testament. By the time we get to the New Testament, Assyria is out of the picture. They've been superseded by Babylon. They've been superseded by Greece. And they have been superseded by the Romans. And so now we have God's people, now known as the Jews, ruled by the Roman Empire. And it's about then that Jesus comes on the scene and begins his ministry. But uh, he, at, on one occasion, he visited his friends in the town of Bethany, the sisters Mary and Martha, and their brother Lazarus. And on this occasion, the Gospel of Luke says that Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. So Martha's running around making sure that all the fine china is set out, making sure the meal is coming along nice. And there's her sister Mary just sitting there listening to Jesus talk. And Martha gets angry and, and, and says, Jesus, why don't you make her help me? And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. You see, Martha was a worrier. She was obsessive over, uh, over the minute details of, 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 well, what is expected of, of a host. And what Jesus is telling her is, look, there's a, there are priorities here, and you're ignoring the more important things for the sake of the less important things. You're worrying about things that in the long run and in the big picture don't really matter 
and you're missing out on what really does matter. I hope that speaks to some of you who are listening this morning. Now, God wasn't done with Martha. She grew past her worry, past her misplaced priorities. Later on, when her brother Lazarus died, Martha was upset, don't get me wrong. She and her sister both told Jesus, look, if you had come earlier, Lazarus wouldn't have died in the first place. But Martha, nevertheless, despite her frustration that Jesus hadn't been there, she says, I believe that you're the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. She still believed in who Jesus was, still trusted him. She was able to look past her worry and her emotion to Jesus himself. Spoiler alert, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. One more person to talk about. Jesus, as you know, recruited 12 men, including a man by the name of Peter, to travel with him and learn from him. Now, the night that Jesus was arrested... Before he was crucified, Peter draws a sword and cuts off a man's ear. One of many instances where Peter seems impetuous, impatient, and even temperamental. Later on, when he betrays Jesus, he angrily asserts that he doesn't know Jesus. So, Peter had a bit of a temper. And as we said earlier, anger can make us do some really dumb and destructive things. And then later on, this Peter, who cut, once cut off the ear of his enemy, uh, writes his own letter. We get Peter's own words here. Later in his life, he writes, Live such good lives among the pagans, among the non-believers, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. The same guy who cut off the ear of his enemy is now encouraging others to show God's goodness through their good deeds to their enemies. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers, fear God, honor the emperor. Caesar was a a persecutor of Christians. He was the enemy of Christians if there ever was one. And yet Peter is saying, honor him. Be an upstanding citizen. Show God's glory through your character. Because Peter had learned to love rather than give in to his anger. There's a Star Wars quote that snuck in there. But it's, it's a reality that's reflected in our fiction. That we know giving in to our anger, giving in to our fear, giving in to our despair, is destructive. Our feelings can betray us. Even our happiness can betray us. There are things that make us happy that are, in the big picture, destructive to us, to others, maybe to society at large. Our feelings can betray us. But God's will for us God's plan and purpose for us won't let us down. What is right is right, no matter how we feel about it. What is wrong is wrong, no matter how we feel about it. And so we must push through the weakness that our feelings and emotions bring and submit our wills to God's will to find strength in God in the midst of our human weakness. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the strength that you give us. We thank you for our emotions. They are a gift. They are part of what makes us human, part of how we reflect your image. 
and yet out of control and, and, and manipulated by evil, they can betray us. Help us to tell the difference between when our emotions are telling us something that we need to listen to and when we need to be in charge instead of our emotions. Lord, you have given us the capacity to act against our emotions when the situation calls for it. And when it comes to obeying you and your will, often our emotions are at odds with what you want from us, with what you are asking us to do. And so, God, help us to recognize when our emotions are a stumbling block, an obstacle to obeying you, and help us to obey you rather than how we feel. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we get ready to conclude our worship this morning, I want to sing another song with you. This is the same one that will be sung by the gathered congregation in person in worship this morning. And that song is Jesus Calls Us. And pay attention to all of the things that might present obstacles to answering Jesus' call that we are enabled to overcome in the lyrics of this song. Let's sing together. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult of our lives, wild restless sea. Day by day his sweet voice soundeth, saying, Christian, follow me. As of old the apostles heard it by the Galilean lake, turn from home and toil and kindred, leaving all for Jesus' sake. Jesus calls us from the worship of the world's vain golden store. From each idol that would keep us saying, Christian, love me more. In our joys and in our sorrows, days of toil and hours of ease, still he calls in cares and pleasures, Christian, love me more than these. Jesus calls us by his mercies, Savior, may we hear thy call. Give our hearts to thine obedience, serve and love thee best of all. And now as you go about your week, may you listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And may the Spirit's voice be louder than your feelings, so that you might obey God's will and call on your life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.